summer classes for students in summer, CCFF has proposed to do away with pro rata pay for full-time faculty and a return for a 7% increase to their base pay. What is your position on this matter? Well, my position is it's a great idea. However, uh, with 89% of our current budget going to salaries and benefits, we have to look very closely at that 7% offset. And also the fact that not all faculty teach summer schools. Some choose not to. Some don't even have the opportunity when you start looking at health occupations division. So by giving everybody a raise to offset that um, pro rata pay would benefit everybody on this campus because every faculty member would receive a raise, make more money, and it would benefit everybody for the rest of their life. It would increase their base pay. When they retire, their pension would be greater. So it's a great idea, but with an 89% salaries and benefits, we need to take a very close look at that 7%. I would be 100% in favor if the offset was equal to and not raise that percentage. It is highly recommended within the State uh, uh, Community College League that 85% of your budget should be the maximum amount for salaries and benefits. We're well over that. Our, our faculty is fairly well compensated, not the best. We are 28th in the state as of fall of 2011. Average salary, a little over $88,000 for faculty. There are other faculties making a lot more money, and we should be looking at that as well. And I think that anything else we can do to help faculty is to our benefit and the students' benefits. A well-paid faculty is going to benefit our students in the long run, and that's why we're all here, to benefit the students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mrs. Avalos? Thank you. I'm glad you made these a little bit bigger. I'm rushing here from another meeting at work, so I appreciate that. Well, I think uh, Mr. Jackson has pretty much given you the statistics and the data to, um, to help you understand really what the board is up against. And that's an 89 percentage of you know, benefits and salaries going from our general budget going to our employees. That is a large amount. However, for years, you know, people said, don't touch pro rata pay, it's political suicide. I, on the other hand, think that as educators, you should be valued and you wanna be able to retire comfortably. You shouldn't have to think about having to have a job after you've retired to be able to make ends meet. So I think this is a great idea. However, again, as Mr. Jackson also stated, we really need to look at you know, whether Prop 30 is gonna pass, what our situation is gonna look like if it doesn't pass, and be very realistic at, at, at uh, looking at those numbers. I think it would be, uh, we would be giving you false hope to say we're gonna definitely do this if at the end of the day you're gonna tell us you lied to us. I'd rather be upfront and honest with all of the employees, particularly with the faculty, uh, because I think that you deserve that. So it's a great idea. I think the implementation of it will be something that needs to be looked at and addressed because I think at the end of the day, you deserve to have the honesty and have everything put on the table so that you're really able to make those evaluations. Maybe it's 5%, maybe it'll be 8%. We don't really know that yet. That's gonna depend again on whether Prop 30 passes or not. I think on the upside, it's a very positive way to look at you know, what we've spent on the pro rata pay and see if it balances out so that there is no general increase to the amount of money going out of our general fund. At the end of the day, we want to be able to facilitate more courses to our students who, if most of you have read, has been, there's been a decrease and a decline in enrollment, particularly because of the availability of courses or lack thereof. So I think that's something that we definitely need to look at. In theory, it's a great idea. I would support that. Thank you. Moving on to the next question, it's a two-part question. In these economic times, there's a public call for shared sacrifice. How would you implement this? I just read a definition of sac uh, shared sacrifice. Uh, in, when it comes from Sacramento or Washington, it usually means our taxes are going up. But that's not my interpretation. Shared sacrifice to me means that if anybody takes a hit, everybody takes a hit. And part of this question is going to deal with part-timers. And when I look at part-timers, I was a part-time faculty member for four years, and I was here when the times were really good. Right now, times are not so good, and what happens is part-time takes the brunt of it. 
and I think shared sacrifice would mean to me that if a part-timer is losing their full assignment and full-timers are sitting with a full overload, there should be some shared sacrifice. If everybody takes a cut, or anybody takes a cut in pay, everybody gets a cut in pay. So that's my definition of shared sacrifice. Everybody shares equally across the board. Thank you. Mrs. Alvarez? And I agree. I mean, I think that this is one of those questions where most people, I think, are in agreement that it should be across the board. And I guess this is the, the question then rise, that arises to me and my thoughts are, you know, how much of a load is that per, for every individual? Because everybody makes different amounts and everybody has different positions. And what does that mean and how do we retain those qualified individuals to continue to be here at Cerritos College? So I think, again, I think that's something that really needs to be addressed because I don't think that everybody, you know, cutting 10 percent into everybody's pay is equitable to those who are at the bottom. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at. The other thing too, I mean, you know, one of the things that uh, this board has done consistently is given themselves a raise every December. Maybe we don't. Maybe we shouldn't do that for five years. Whatever the case might be. Because I think that is, shared, that is a shared sacrifice on all ends. I mean, everything goes up and, you know, we need to understand what our employees are going through and definitely what our students are going through when we talk about increases in tuition and books and things of that sort. So I think, again, we need to be more realistic about what it is and how we address it. Thank you. Moving on to the second part of this question, how will you boost the morale of our part-time faculty who teach a significant portion of our <coughs> students, yet earn one of the lowest pay scales in the state, who are not compensated for office hours, and who have neither benefits nor job security? About four years ago, we started making a move in that direction. We did give the part-time faculty a larger raise than we gave the full-time faculty, and the intent was to continue that move. Well, obviously with that ran out because nobody's getting raises, including the board. And so therefore, uh, I think we need to, as soon as we have money, uh, we should focus on increasing the benefits to the uh, part-time faculty, the adjuncts. Uh, they do need more pay. We need to seriously look at the benefits we need to pay them for office hours and we need to provide office space. I know when I was a full-time faculty, I shared my office with two part-timers. They had a key to my office. They were welcome to come in. The nights I wasn't there, they were there. So we need to see more of that sharing of space on this campus as well. We don't have offices for every part-time faculty, but we sure could share. Thank you. And on that particular subject, I, you know, I agree. I think, you know, the space belongs to everybody who works here, particularly to our faculty who obviously need time to be able to meet with their students to make sure that we do have student success. And one of those ways is to have access to your professors and your instructors. So I think that that's very important. Again, I think that that question should really bounce back to our faculty union about what are you doing to support some of your faculty who are part time? And how are we sharing some of those resources that are already available? Uh, I think it's very important that at the end of the day, we continue to look at why we're here. And that's to really make students successful as they move on to their journey to uh, hopefully a better quality of life and hopefully definitely be successful in life at whatever endeavor they choose to, to, to pursue. Uh, on the other end, we also have, uh, oh, sorry, did I read the second question? Oh, access to community college wage, oh, I'm sorry, repeat the question, I'm, I'm, I've We're lost track. We're on the second of part of B here, so I think you did address that. Okay, so, you did answer it. Okay, so again, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, our part-timers do get paid a lot less. Um, Obviously, we wish we could provide opportunities to be able to make them all full time. But as you know, our numbers are decreasing. And how do we address the issues of not having just space availability? We do have parameters that we need to work with. And our infrastructure, as you know, is, is underway to improve the, the, the availability of buildings and the availability of access to space. And right now, we're very limited. As many of you know, we're bursting at the seams. So I think, really, we need to go back and look at those groups who are part of, of our, our institution here and help them help address those concerns and problems for all of our faculty, not just our full-timers, but our part-timers as well. Thank you. Moving on to the next question here generated by students. Uh, students are concerned about increasing unit costs, rising book prices, and fewer classes offered by the college. What is your plan to reduce costs, costs directed towards students? Well, first of all, tuition cost or unit cost. That's controlled by our state legislature. Mm -hmm. We have no control over that. However, your board continually goes to Sacramento and to our local uh, legislators 
to advocate everything we can do to cut costs, cut tuition costs, do something to find different sources other than raising the price to students. So we do that. We ask that students do the same thing. Go to Sacramento. Go to your local legislator's office and advocate for lower tuition cost. Right now, the only thing we see is increases, and that is not good. Book costs, those are regulated by the bookstore. The bookstore is a private operation on this campus, and granted, they do give a portion of their profits to ASCC. So some of that comes back to the students, but not directly. You can also look at the kaleidoscope program that we have, the, the uh, grant that we receive for uh, open sources, and there are books online for many of our classes. You can get e-books. Our bookstore rents books. You can buy used books. Take a class with a good friend. Has to be a really good friend, somebody you know really well, and share a textbook with them. Uh, but don't let it go too far astray. So those are some of the things you can do to cut cost. Um, you know, make a 50-50 custody agreement with your friend if you share a book. But um, other than that, it, it's a really tough road. I, I, I don't envy you one bit the position that you are in today. But don't forget, community college is the best deal in the country in California. $46 is a lot of money, but try comparing that to some of the other schools and uh, in other states, and you'll see that we have a really great deal here. Thank you. And I only have 30 seconds, so I'm gonna make that really quick. I think most of our students, I can you know, commend you, we have bright, talented students, and I think everything that Mr. Jackson has uh, touched upon in order to reduce some of those costs, you guys Carmen, are probably you have already two doing. You have oh, two, two minutes. minutes, okay, he had 30 seconds, great. Um, so I think a lot of those cost uh, savings, um, you know, tactics have probably already been implemented by many of you. Uh, as we all know, you know, our, our dollar keeps shrinking. And as costs go up, and as Mr. Jackson stated, we don't have any control over that as trustees. What we do have some control over is perhaps looking at ways to provide some of those services for you so that you're not reinventing the wheel every semester trying to figure out ways to cut down on cost. We have no control over what tuition is gonna cost. So what we do have is an opportunity to be your voices and your advocates at the state level as well as the federal level because we do have great relationships with our local elected officials. And in saying that, you know, our, our new senator that will be uh, on board in 2012 at the end of the year is on the Higher Education Committee. So that's certainly someone that we will have as a resource to be able to tap into to help facilitate some of those channels to try to get some of those costs reduced. And again, you know, most of you are here because you are advocates for higher education and obviously lowering tuition and making things accessible to the student population. So I, you know, I commend you for that. It takes a lot of courage to be here and sometimes get involved politically to be able to do that. So in regards to some of the other cost savings, obviously, you know, maybe a loan book program could be instituted on our, on our campus if it hasn't been already. I know that the student organizations, some of them have tried to do that. Some of it is working, some of it is not working. As you know, it takes a lot of time and energy and effort to be able to coordinate courses, books, and everything uh, of that nature. So I commend those of you who are already trying to find ways to help your fellow students in being able to supplement or reduce or eliminate, in some cases, cost of books. And I don't know what else to tell you in reference to that, other than maybe we need to talk to our book publishers about maybe releasing editions every three years versus every year or every two years. Because the reality is our books increase and the only thing that may have changed is the way that they organize the chapters. It's, it's just a reality. But anyhow, those are some of the ideas that I'm sure some of you have already implemented. So really, we're just regurgitating some of your great work. So thanks for that. Thank you very much. Looking at our last question generated by ACC, Many of the students at Cerritos College lack basic skills. They need academic guidance and traditional classroom instruction as opposed to computer-aided instruction. At the same time, in this physical crisis, an increasing number of students are unable to transfer to a four-year university due to section cuts. How do you ensure an open access community college stay true to its mission? Well, unfortunately, the open access community college is not like we had four years ago. Due to changes, especially this priority enrollment, it's going to affect a lot of people. No longer can you just take as many classes and as many different um, fun things as you used to because now we have some restrictions placed upon us. The number of classes sections is being reduced by the budget cuts 
And as a result of that, there are too many students for what seats are available. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be giving uh, the Tom and Marie Jackson scholarship to a young man who just graduated from high school with honors. He did everything right. He did the online orientation. He took all of the placement e exams. He placed very highly in English and math. He is a very good student, and yet he could not get a class until the second nine weeks. He has two classes starting in the second nine weeks. It's tough, and I don't envy you one bit. So open access, it's not there anymore, folks. It's going to get more competitive unless we can get more funding from our state, more funding to open more sections and give you a better shot at what you need to do. We do have, and my colleague alluded to this earlier, one of the best deals on campus is three years at community college tuition and a fourth year at Northwood University. You don't even have to leave campus. It's just right over here by the, in the Automotive Partners Building. And so three years at community college tuition, one year at Northwood tuition, which is, I don't know. Um, I think it'll cost you $10,000 $10, for that fourth year, a BA degree. And you don't even have to leave campus. So we do have some things for you. But again, uh, open access until we get more funds, uh, it's not going to happen for a while. We need more money. Advocate your local legislators. Call them, write them, email them, visit their field office, do anything you can to encourage more funds for community colleges. We need all the help we can get. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Okay, and in so regards to just making more courses available, I think Mr. Jackson mentioned that we have Northwood University here on campus. One of the things that I can definitely relate to as a student, as a parent, I have two children now in a community college. They both go to different schools, and I can only tell you that I had to honestly tell my sons the first semester is a throwaway semester, because you're lucky if you get any class. That's how bad the situation is for our students right now. That's reality. The one positive thing is that one of our assembly members, I think it's Padilla, who put out, uh, and I can't remember the name, but it's, it's an assembly bill, basically limiting the amount of um, college credits and giving priority to students who are actually moving on to go on to transfer. I think that's a positive for you as students. I think one of the important things is that we need to build more partnerships. One of the things that is happening right now is that we're losing a lot of our students to our private institutions, such as National University and the University of Phoenix. I think they're great institutions, but I think that the amount of debt that our students are accumulating is just e extraordinary. I think we are now in, I mean, our students now have more debt than ever before in this country. What are we doing to be able to facilitate some of those courses, perhaps at Cerritos College? So let's build some more partnerships. For example, one of the things that uh, I'm very proud of is that I was able to bring in the Cal California State University Northridge to uh, the city of Southgate, which is where I work and it's where, where I, I'm the city clerk. And one of the things that we're actually gonna be offering is a bachelor's completion program. That means that the university sends all of their professors to us at the city hall. We provide the classes. They are done in eight week intervals. Everything is set up for the student. The cost is about $20,000 total uh, for a master's degree. And I think it's about 15 to $12,000, between 12 and $15,000 for a bachelor's degree. That's pretty comparable for Cal State prices. I think it's a great opportunity to, one, reduce the space that may not be available on our local campuses, bring education to the community, and offer them higher education incentives by being uh, local, staying at home, saving you on gas, hopefully saving you on books, because we can do hybrid programs. That means some classes are online, other classes are uh, in person, such as, you know, we would have a setup such as this here. But I think that we really need to be able to explore things outside of the box and be able to offer those to our students. So those are some of the things that I think would be beneficial to be able to offer, A, more courses, and maybe you know, produce uh, classes that we really need to take to get them to transfer. So those are some of, some of the things we need to look at. Thank you very much. That's the time that we have for the questions this morning. We have a few minutes available, so I'm gonna open it up to question and answers from the mm -hmm. audience. If any of you have a question to post to one of our candidates here, go ahead and do so. And we have a microphone that's gonna Come around. Any, any questions? Solomon. Go ahead and mm -hmm. hold your hand up, please. <laughs> Where should I, too? <laughs> so the question um, that I have, and I want to thank you guys for coming up there, is about the e-books. 
a lot of teachers are requesting for us to get online because it's, you know, it's better and everything and poli science stuff. And um, like a lot of you guys say, if you go online and use like online books, it won't really cost or anything like that. But the cost is kind of the same as if you get a used book, which is still kind of pricey. So it's no, like it's, and then on top of that, like within three years, you have to get another access code or it won't be valid anymore. Probably like every semester, that's more and more money coming out of our pocket. So how can, like what advice would you give to students that like, um, you know, have taken classes or need a same access code without having to, you know, keep purchasing one every semester? Because that's like $78 extra every semester for a different like class. You know, so what advice would you give us as students? Thank you. Okay. Um, I was not aware that you were being charged an access fee for an online, free online open resource book. So that's news to me. And why would you have to access that book after you finish the course. So why would you have to renew that access fee every semester unless you're doing other other courses? And, no, you know, I, I'm not really familiar with the fee portion. Okay, I'm sorry. It's, I'm pretty sure other students uh, could relate to it. It's different classes. Like if you're taking different classes, they require the, like an access code. Like for instance, if you take a political science 101 class and you're moving on to like, you know, a higher class, they still require this access code. The access code does not mean it's the same book, but it's the same code that you need a code in order to, you know, go on to the, the uh, online um, book source. You know, you need this access code. So, I mean, that's the question. Carmen, do you want to respond to this at all? What will happen? Is somebody going to... Explain the, what the access code is, just so yeah, there's a better understanding. Really uh, I think she has some, I don't know what that is. Just about political science. You do not pay every semester. You are entitled, you know, by quality to have access for all, you know, for one year. You do not pay every semester. So you can't have, uh, you register for 101 and you buy an access, access code. You are entitled to have access to that, you know, to that uh, uh, platform for one year. For one year. So, so maybe we need to clarify the policies when it comes to those access codes there for students in general. I don't know that we're taking.